the staple of, of liberal, left, liberal politics, especially left-wing politics in the 60s and 70s, was this kind of preoccupied concern about the role of the U.S. security state, the FBI, the CIA, the revelations of the Church Committee, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, McCarthy. This was, you know, a central formative view of left-wing politics in the United States. And now polls show that the greatest support that the CIA, the FBI, the NSA gets is not from Republicans any longer, but there's a lot of skepticism, but from the left wing or liberal wing of the Democratic Party. And there was recently an episode that illustrated that this, which was this story that Matt Taibbi and others did, revealing that the CIA, the FBI, Homeland Security, the U.S. security state is interfering in our politics, trying to censor the internet. This was a story that only got support among Again, the same kind of right-wing, populist wing of the Republicans, and Democrats and liberals were enraged by these revelations, and it culminated last week with this liberal left MSNBC host, Mehdi Hassan, basically declaring the Twitter files to be fraudulent because he found two minor errors that weren't even errors, really, in Taibbi's reporting, and everybody cheered and treated Mehdi Hassan like a hero because they were apparently so angry about exposing the censorship and other nefarious acts of the CIA and the FBI. What happened here, Norman? Why is it the American left and American liberals who now rise in defense of these U.S. security state agencies? Well, first of all, I want to say I don't think it's a left. I don't want to get bogged down definitions, but what's called the liberal left or the woke left. The mainstream left. Really like, like the kind of elected officials, uh, the Bernie I, AOC I left. Think, okay. Uh, I don't consider it the left, and I'll just allow me go uh, ahead, to develop, go ahead. One, uh, develop one theme in the book and then get back to the Nakti Hassan, uh, Matt Taibbi dust up. Uh, one of the main arguments in my book is that the main function of identity politics, the main function of this woke politics, is to stop a left from forming, from forming uh, and from uh, uh, fragmenting it. Now, that's not a theory. That's not speculation. You saw that in action. You saw how during the 2016 presidential campaign, Democratic primary, the 2020 Democratic primary, it was all of the woke left, the woke left, that formed a juggernaut to stop Bernie Sanders. The most woke publication on earth right now is the New York Times. And it's a very interesting fact about the New York Times. The New York Times has two character, had two characteristics. Number one, hyper woke. Number two, hyper anti Bernie. Sydney Ember of the New York Times, she covered the Bernie beat. And her main job was to stop Bernie. When they mentioned him, it was to discredit him. Now, it wasn't just organs like the New York Times. It was the high priests and high priestesses of woke politics, the Ta-Nehisi Coates, the Kimberly Crenshaw, the, the um, Whoopi Goldberg, the Joy Reid. Robin DiAngelo, Ibram Kendi, these are people you name in your book. But these in particular, the ones I named, Angela Davis, Angela Davis, they kept attacking Bernie. He's weak on the reparations question, said Ta-Nehisi Coates. He's weak on the black question, says Angela Davis. When are you going to drop out of the race, snarls Whoopi Goldberg on The View. Joy Reid brings in a body language reader to prove that Bernie is a congenital liar. At the moment of truth, at the moment of truth, the woke politics revealed its rotten, rancid core. And now that brings us to Mehdi Hassan. I know Mehdi only in passing. I met him on a couple of occasions, so I can't claim any personal knowledge of him. However, I have followed aspects of his career. Before the Bernie Sanders campaign, 
its precursor was Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. And at a certain point, just like our ruling elite wanted to stop Bernie, the British ruling elite wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn, who already was the head of the Labour Party. Bernie was you know, still in the primary stage. What happened? This huge hysterical campaign, this hysterical campaign was whipped up accusing the Labour Party under Corbyn's tutelage and then Corbyn himself of being an anti-Semite and the, the party being riddled rife with the Labour Party anti-Semitism. One, one of the first, one of the first uh, slime uh, attacks on Bernie came from this fellow named Jonathan Friedland in the UK. On Corbyn, you mean? On Bernie or Corbyn? Yes. On no, Corbyn. On Corbyn. Right. Yes, it was Jonathan Friedland in the UK. And Friedland started to say that the Labour Party is rife with anti-Semitism. Before you knew it, before you knew it, who joined in with Jonathan Friedland? Who joined in? Nakti Hassan. They wrote a joint letter in which they said, and now I'm quoting us, both of us have condemned Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party for its failure to tackle anti-Jewish racism. Subsequently, Mehdi Hassan... Uh. Filled with torment, filled with pain, consumed by guilt, says, I reluctantly have to conclude. I don't see how else I can conclude anything except that Corbyn is an anti-Semite. Or, I'm paraphrasing him now, so I quote him. He cites a piece in one of the, uh, one of the British periodicals, which said, quote, I gave Corbyn the benefit of the doubt in anti-Semitism. I can't anymore. And then Mehdi Hassan says, who, like me, has defended Corbyn up until now, but like me, struggles to defend his quote-unquote Zionist remarks that have emerged from 2013. This sack of shit opportunist, because what could be more useful to the British as they try to discredit Corbyn as being an anti-Semite than to get a Muslim on board. Because supposedly, Jeremy was partial to Muslims. And here comes along a Muslim who says, I have to admit, I'm so reluctant to have to admit it, but I have no choice. Jeremy Corbyn, he's an anti-Semite. That was so despicable that I went to my email and I sent Mehdi an email that just said, et to Mehdi, the moment of truth, the moment of truth, et to Mehdi. And he replied, he had no idea what I was talking about. This Oxford graduate who prides himself on his mastery of English, he couldn't understand et tu. Well, Nor Mehdi. Norman, 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 so wait, let me just interject here. Um, you know, in general, the hallmark of good careerists is they know their moment to strike. That's what it means to be an opportunist. They exactly. seize their opportunity. And no one, few people do it as better than he. I don't know if you realize, if you know the story, but about six or seven years earlier, he had written an email to the Daily Mail when he was trying to break into I, British I, I, media, I, 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 offering himself up as sort of the house Muslim, saying, I'm a Muslim, I'm a critic of the war on terror, but I'd like to work for you and attack the left on gay rights and abortion, both of which I'm on your side over. He, he, he's very, 
you know, crafty and uh, at, at going. So, so put this into yeah. the, but, 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 but Norin, put this in the context uh, of what he just yeah. did with Matt Taibbi in the Twitter files, because uh, yeah, that's. I, 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 would like, I would like to get to that. Go ahead. Now he's, um, now he's become the woke Avenger at MSNBC. Now, you know and I know, because you're an experienced debater. Everybody knows that they find two errors in what you wrote. The standard line is, this book is replete with errors, but for, the re for reasons of space, I can only name two. That's the standard tactic. That's why everybody stays up nights terrified of making two errors, because they know that two will easily be turned by any hack, any hack interlocutor into rife replete with errors. Now, I listened to Mehdi Hassan. He said to Matt Taibbi, your, your reporting is filled with error after error after error. That's what he said. Now, I have a challenge to Mehdi. When I went on Democracy Now! in 2004 or five, I can't remember now, and I said that Alan Dershowitz's book was filled with false statements, errors, and lies. When I walked out of that studio, and Alan Dershowitz denied my claim, as would be predictable, I said, I have an obligation now. I made that statement on the air. I have an obligation to demonstrate it to prove it, that I'm not playing this. I found two errors, and then, for reasons of space, I could only know. I sat down and wrote a book. Now, I'm saying to Mehdi Hassan, you said error after error after error after error. Sit down and document that claim. Not necessarily in a book, I, but even like a post, I, like a post, yes, a blog I'm, post. I'm sure, I'm sure MSNBC will give you a leave of absence to document it. And if you notice, he said at one point, we have found error after error after error, which means the hacks at MSNBC desperately tried to find something and then passed it over to him. So I'm sure MSNBC will give him the hacks that supply those three errors. You sit down and produce the document that shows error after error after error. If you produce it, my hat's off to you. If you don't, you're a blowhard. And a fraud. So, Norman, Norm, let me just ask you this question. Uh, well, let's repeat it. Right. Produce that document so here here's the, the the thing that i find so interesting about this is when i did the snowden reporting and we exposed the activities of the nsa that were unconstitutional and illegal spying on americans and mass obviously the people who set out to discredit the reporting and me were defenders of the nsa the people who believed in the u.s security state that was totally predictable the u.s government it's kind of apparatchiks and media and the think tank world. Those are the people who attacked me, which made sense. They wanted to malign the reporting because the reporting exposed an agency they support, which is the NSA. Matt Taibbi's reporting exposed the nefarious acts of the CIA, Homeland Security, the FBI. Why is Mehdi Hassan, who still identifies, as he said in his uh, op-ed attacking Jeremy Corbyn, I, like him, am a man of the left, why is Mehdi Hassan so eager to malign reporting and reporters which expose the CIA, the FBI, and Homeland Security? Because that's their job. That's why I think it's wrong to describe them as a left. Their purpose is, there's basically three purposes. Purpose number one of this woke left, this MSNBC left, is to provide a new base for the Democratic Party. Large numbers of white workers, which used to be the base of the Democratic Party, have exited or have been, in effect, asked to leave. So there is a vacuum there. And the vacuum has to be filled. A party needs a base. It's not just who votes on election day. It needs a mobilized, galvanized, committed base. So identity politics has to fill, has, uh, 
uh, then um, um, uh, conscripted to fill that void, that vacuum. You're too young to remember. I have to keep Correct. repeating that because no, go keep changed. keep saying that. That's important. Things very, okay, things change very significantly. You go back and listen, 1984 to Mario Cuomo's keynote address at the Democratic Party convention. It was all about supporting the working class, and it was ta attacking the Republican Party for being the party of the rich. And we, the Democratic Party, are the party of the working class. You go look, I did, I, I sat down and I listened to uh, the nights, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it was either four nights or five nights, I think four nights, of the Democratic Convention. The uh, working class was barely mentioned. It was literally barely mentioned. There was one tiny segment devoted to four workers, and uh, at uh, Channel 13, it was uh, cut. They cut it. So to, fill, to, to um, uh, fill the void uh, in the Democratic Party, number two, to create a, um, a, uh, a uh, juggernaut to stop a class struggle uh, mobilization from below, like Bernie Sanders. That's their job, to stop it. And number three, the purpose of woke politics is to give a veneer, a patina of being progressive to being cutting edge, uh, while at the same time, not making any sacrifices. What does it take for people in Martha's Vineyard to be woke? Do they pay a price? Do they have to give up any of their wealth? There's no sacrifice nowadays to these woke politics. You know, if you go back and you look at the history of the left, people are killed for being on the left. They're in jail for being on the left. That's what it meant to be a person of the left. And then making real, material, and mortal sacrifice for a cause. What does it mean now? You go and look at the Judith Butler. In 2020, there's a big announcement, a big announcement. Judith Butler is doing something world historic, right up there with the Paris Commune, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Spanish Civil War. What does she do? She announces that her new pronouns are they, them. Her new pronouns are they, them. Oh, that's a real act of martyrdom. That's Christ being nailed to the cross. It's so laughable what passes now for radical politics. Radical politics is raking in tons and tons and tons of cash. That's radical politics. Ibram X. Kendi gets $10 million from Jack Dorsey. Barack Obama gets $100 million from Jeff Bezos. Van Jones gets $100 million from Jeff Bezos. The Black Lives Matter so-called leadership they collected $90 million in the year of the George Floyd demonstrations. None of the activists saw one dime of it, but Patrice Coolers, one of the so-called leaders, she goes out and purchases four homes. Another of the leaders starts doing commercials for Cadillac. This is a bonanza. This is a bonanza. This is not sacrifice. This is not what the left used to stand for. It's just making money, grifters. There are grifters making money off of the courts on the one hand, and then there are all these fake radical people pretending they are so cutting edge and so woke because they change their pronouns or they drool over trans people. This is so, you know, it just, I sit down at night lately and I read the classic literature, you know, people like Rosa Luxemburg, and I watch how if you read their literature, you know, even Gandhi, Gandhi's actually uh, another example, even though he never considered himself of the radical left, how they count every penny that they get for the cause to make sure 
that every single dime is accounted for. This is the people's money. This is the people's cause. And then I see people like, even after all the scandals with Patrice Cullors, she's invited back to democracy now, which called itself the exception to the rulers. After all the scandals, they didn't ask her, or the moderator didn't ask her a single question about all the allegations against her. So many people's organizations, grassroots organizations, the mothers, the mothers of the kids who were killed were charging that they weren't seeing a dime of that $90 million that was connected. And you don't hold, you don't hold the leaders accountable at all because they're woke, because they're part of the in crowd, because they hang out at Martha's Vineyard, because they show up at Sundance Film Festival. You want me to call that the left? That has nothing whatsoever to do with any kind of left that I have ever known. And it's certainly not a left with which I'm about to identify or to give a free pass in the name of solidarity. Solidarity with whom? Where are the sacrifices for the cause? I don't see it. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.